There are few, if any, events in life that are as anticipated or as emotional as the delivery of a child. It's something that parents have waited months, maybe even years for, and it's a day that changes everything because it's a day that becomes a birthday, which is something they're gonna celebrate every year for the rest of their lives. As a high-risk pregnancy doctor, my team's goal is the same every single delivery, and that's we want a happy mom and a happy baby. But have you ever thought about what it takes to train a provider to be ready during that critical time? I still remember my first delivery like it was yesterday. I was a third year medical student and I was on rotation in Hawaii and I was walking down the hall and one of the residents said, hey Shad, you wanna do a delivery? I said, sure. And I ran down the hall and I ran into the room and, and they put a gown on me and put gloves on and, and it was the woman's fourth baby. So things were going really quickly. And I forgot to put a mask on, so they tied one on and it had a face shield. And I sat down as she was starting to push, and I took a deep breath and I let it out, and <sighs> my entire mask fogged up. And I couldn't see a thing. I hadn't pinched the nose because I'd been so busy getting in there, and I was sterile and I didn't know what to do. So I held my breath. And it slowly started to get better. And then she said, I gotta push! And the head started to come out, and I went, <sighs> And I just stuck my hands out, and luckily, the baby fell into my arms. <laughs> and that was my first delivery. <laughs> now, does that make anybody uncomfortable? <laughs> because when I, when I tell that story to medical people, they all kind of chuckle and laugh because they've been there. They know what that feels like. And then when I tell my wife, she's horrified. <laughs> and she can't believe that we actually do things like that. You see, medicine's been taught as see one, do one, teach one for a long time. And you might be okay being the see one, but are you okay with the do one? What if it's your first child? What if there's a complication? So let's compare that story to something else, where we put our lives in someone else's hands on a regular basis. How many of you would get on a plane if you knew that the pilot was really smart, had been to a couple years of school, had watched some takeoffs and landings, <laughs> but had never had their hands on the controls. You probably wouldn't. So how do we train those pilots? They have to go through over 70 hours of high fidelity virtual reality flight simulator training before they get in a training cockpit. And that's way before they ever take care of you. So I'd ask you, is it any less important to train the provider that's going to be there to take care of that baby at the moment of its birth. Now the good news is, in simulation, we actually have OB simulators that we are starting to use so we can practice and we can get better. So if you're wondering what OB simulation looks like, it's been around for a long time. It's some of the earliest medical simulators ever described. And in the 1700s, there was a midwife in the court of King Louis XV who created one called the machine, which is an interesting name. And it was an anatomically correct, life-size birthing pelvis made out of wicker, padded with sponges, covered in leather, and then they had little cloth babies to practice deliveries. Now, even though we've had these for over 400 years, it's really only in the past 10, maybe, that we've started to use them on a regular basis, and we've figured out how well they work. So after my delivery that I didn't see, I actually liked obstetrics, and so I did a residency in it, and I even subspecialized and went into high-risk pregnancies. And I was doing my fellowship. I was a few months in. I was on call at night, because that's when everything happens. On call, middle of the night, no backup, it's fine. <laughs> and I was taking care of a couple, and they were expecting their first child. Everything was fine. It was uncomplicated. I was working with the resident. Uh, as the mom pushed, and the baby's head came out, and the resident tried to guide the rest of it out, it wouldn't move and the baby started to turn blue. So this is called a shoulder dystocia, and it happens when the anterior shoulder of the baby gets stuck behind the maternal pubic bone. Just from getting stuck there, the baby can have a temporary or a permanent nerve injury. At this time, the umbilical cord's also compressed, and so there may be no blood flow, no oxygen. It happens in one to three percent of all deliveries, so if you deliver babies, you're going to see it, and you have to be prepared. As soon as I figured it out, I started doing interventions and I was able to deliver the baby in a couple minutes. And I turned around and I handed a blue, limp, 
baby boy that wasn't breathing to the pediatrician. He took him over to the warmer and started to resuscitate him, and after a few minutes, which it seemed like a lifetime, the baby gave a cry. And we all took a deep breath. But later that night, I sat down with the team, and I talked with them, and it turns out that over half of them had never seen a shoulder dissociate before. And I realized it was the first one that I had ever been in charge of. And then it hit me. If we're doing the see one, do one, teach one model, they'd all just seen one. But we weren't ready to do one as well as we should have been. And so we had to figure out a way to teach one. And that's when I started doing simulation. I applied for a grant at my hospital and purchased a birthing simulator that I found in a catalog. It was a full body mannequin, head to toe, and it said it could do regular deliveries. But I figured I could play with it and I could make it do complicated ones. So I ordered it and then a box showed up a couple weeks later. <laughs> and, I re and this is before Amazon Prime, so realize <laughs> things just don't show up all the time. I also forgot to tell my wife I did this. <laughs> and she had just started staying home with our first child from teaching, and I was working 80 to 100 hours a week, and so in her mind, when she sees this box shows up, She's thinking present. So you can imagine what she thought when she opened it up. <laughs> and saw that. So uh, I got an interesting phone call after that. And uh, she said, do you know there's a woman in a bag? And I said, I said the baby's showing up tomorrow. So after I got through that, um, I, I, took it to I took it to work, and I actually set it up in a room that was near labor and delivery. And this is a picture of it. I started training medical students and residents on how to do regular deliveries and complicated deliveries. And then I decided, let's do some research on it. Let's figure out if this actually works. And we found that there's three areas for OB simulation that really make a difference. So the first one is individual skills. Yes, that's blood. For anybody that doesn't recognize that, that's a nice postpartum hemorrhage. Because here's the thing, taking care of women on labor and delivery, doing deliveries, managing hemorrhages and emergencies, it's a hands-on thing. And you have to practice. Let me ask you this. The first time you got behind the wheel of a car, after you'd done driver's ed and you'd watched all the awful videos, and you'd taken all your tests, how confident were you? Were you an expert? Were you ready for anything that happened? No, you had to practice. And so I wanted to see if the book knowledge that I knew my residents had would translate into performance. So I took residents from three different institutions, and we trained them on a hemorrhage. So we had the mannequin, and it delivered a baby, and it bled like stink, and they had to do some interventions. They had to give two medications that we give all the time, and they had to do it correctly. And what we found is that only 45% of them were able to do it. I thought it was wrong. I, I was actually pretty sure, I'm like, I know they know this stuff, there's no way that's right. But you know, about the same time over in the UK, they tested all of their providers that were doing deliveries on a shoulder dystocia simulation to see if they could deliver the baby. And you know what they found? Only 44% could. So here's the thing, the good news about simulation is we can not just determine where we need to practice, but we can fix things, because the group over in the UK, they recognized it. So they trained everybody with the simulator. And then they looked for four years afterwards at actual deliveries that had a shoulder dystocia. And they found that if you trained with the simulator and you just practiced with it, you could decrease neonatal brachial plexus injuries, that's the nerve injury, fourfold. So if this is 100 babies that would have been injured during a shoulder dystocia before the training, all those babies in green, they're crawling around, they're doing great. So we talked about individual skills, and then we moved on, and we started looking at teamwork and communication. Because it turns out that that's just as, if not more important. We know from the literature that over 60% of bad outcomes in medicine are because of breakdowns in communication. But we don't spend 60% of our time practicing that. We don't train on it. And you may be thinking, well, that's great, but how does simulation help with this? So there's a group out in Minnesota that did a study. They went to labor and delivery units at three different hospitals. The first one, they did no training. That was the control group. 
The second one, they did teamwork training, something called Team Steps, which is a medically oriented teamwork training program based on aviation safety. And then at the third one, they did teamwork training, but then they also did simulation. And then they looked at their outcomes for two years, and here's what they found. First one, no change, no surprise. Teamwork training, no change. Teamwork training and simulation, a 37% decrease in perinatal morbidity. So what's that mean? It means that fewer bad things happen to moms and babies. Now once you've got the individual skills and you've got the teamwork, that's awesome, so what do you need to do next? I call it IRL, which is as much texting as I know, and my kids make fun of me for that, but IRL in real life, you need to go practice on your unit. You need to go practice where you actually take care of patients because every unit's different. And going back to the car analogy, when you're driving your car, you're comfortable. You know where everything is. You can find the windshield wiper. You can turn the radio on, air conditioning. I mean, you're good. But what happens when you get in another car? What happens if you get a rental? I can never find whatever that lever is to release the gas thing. I can never find that. You're just not as good. You're not as comfortable. And if there's an emergency, you're not going to be as good. Well, and what we do in obstetrics, seconds and minutes count, and they can mean lives. So we started doing drills on labor and delivery, and we found all sorts of things. One of the things we found is that when you have an emergency, everyone runs to the emergency, which is good. But our wards are locked. Labor and delivery wards are locked, and that's so the people who aren't supposed to walk off with babies don't. But if everybody runs to the emergency and nobody's at the door to let the code team in, then you're standing there doing chest compressions wondering where the code team is. We were in another room and we were talking about emergencies and we were going over the code drill and I looked on the wall because we were trying to call for a code, luckily in a simulation. That's what was on the wall. Now it is, it is what you think it is. It's a blue sticky note that says code blue button here. So I asked, I said, does anything happen if I push that? They said no. But you know what, we found it and we saw it before something else happened. Now, I've been talking about OB simulation, and I've been talking about the US and the UK, but the potential for OB simulation to make a difference is really global. O every day in the world, over 800 women die from a preventable cause related to pregnancy and delivery. And over 99% of those are in developing countries. And what's the most common cause? Hemorrhage, which is something that we can actually train for. When I was deployed over in Iraq, we actually took the birthing simulator over. See, it doesn't just show up on the doorstep, it comes all the way over to a combat zone. It's very interesting getting it in and out of an armored suburban. <laughs> we did not put body ar armor on it, but we thought about it. So we did some training over there, that was great. But there are companies now that are making simulation. These are nice, basic, inexpensive simulators that can train regular deliveries and hemorrhage. They're inexpensive. Matter of fact, this company will even donate one to a developing country for every one that you buy. And they're small enough that you can fit them in a backpack. They're also small enough that I was able to bring one today so I can show it to you and I can demonstrate it. It was interesting getting through airport security. <laughs> I will say that. I do a lot of explaining. Come on up. So this is Rhonda, who I just met tonight. <laughs> Let's give her a hand. And I, I have convinced her to uh, come up and let me do a delivery. So, so how many babies have you had? Lots. Okay, good. C-sections? Okay, so this is a new, this is a first. All right. So you ready? Okay, so go ahead and push. Do you want an epidural? Sure. Okay, all right. He That's pushed in. You do it. Good. Come on. Come on. There you go. Good job. All right. All right, good job. All right, it's a, I don't know, I can't tell. <laughs> it's, a, it's, an in, it's, a, it's an inexpensive simulator. All right, well, you did a great job. <laughs> ah. And if you can see, that's actually a hemorrhage right there. And the good news is with the hemorrhage, is that something that we can train people to prevent and we can train people to fix if it happens? Thank you.
So I've been doing medical simulation for over 10 years, and I've gotten teased about it a few times. Um, there are days where I come back to my office and uh, <laughs> find one of my simulators sitting there waiting for me to start working. Uh, there are days where my middle son actually says to me, hey, Dad, you going to go see real or fake patients today? <laughs> but that's okay. And I, and I do it because I believe, because I believe that it can make a difference. Because I believe that there are no second chances in real life. And I believe that mistakes in the delivery room can last a lifetime. Or they can cut a lifetime short. I think we can do better with simulation and obstetrics. And I think that every birthday deserves a team that is as excited and prepared to meet that baby as the parents are. Thank you.